patients. Uh, I was hoping we might uh, get some additional attendance, but uh, it's good to be with you th for whom uh, who can make it. Uh, so welcome. Uh, today we're going to be going through uh, a topic that um, in many ways will unite uh, topics we've covered thus far within this discussion group, um, but take them rather further, hopefully both in terms of uh, intuition uh, and particularly in terms of their relationship with one another. Uh, I'm rather fond of the analogy of, um, of uh, the water hole and, and talking about if you uh, set your sights on a water hole in the savanna, uh, as I did in my youth, um, uh, you know, one can learn all sorts of things about um, the fauna uh, and some of the flora of, of that area because uh, all the animals in that area, the savanna, uh, save those that are not obligate water drinkers, will, will make their way to this watering hole. And, and just by observing the watering hole, you can, uh, you can learn a lot about uh, the animals, their habits, their interactions, um, predatory behavior, etc. And uh, I like to think of adjunctions in, in this light. Um, uh, adjunctions form this topic that um, uh, on the face of it might seem strangely foreign. Uh, it might seem um, daunting. It, it might seem uh, overly dry. But if you really come to, to observe carefully uh, what's going on with adjunctions, you can uh, learn a tremendous amount uh, of practical value while also familiarizing yourself with, uh, with the uh, fauna, um, the diverse ecosystem uh, associated with category theory more generally. Uh, so I think of adjunctions as kind of bringing into focus um, and into uh, practical application in many spheres uh, that we'll talk about, um, a, a dozens of, of core concepts from category theory and really knitting them together in ways that help appreciate uh, uh, their importance, their relationship to one another, their relevance to practical use, et cetera. Uh, so today we're going to, to take an initial look at adjunctions in a way that will be admittedly um, a bit dry. I, I do have some application examples uh, scrolled in there uh, towards the end. I, I certainly talk about the potential for application to a much larger set, uh, but hopefully some of the videos I've asked you to examine prior to this session will also have clued you in to many spheres of application and motivation uh, that may make you hungry to go a bit deeper. Um, and uh, a lot of my task today, I think, will be taking those references that I've provided to you. Um, and I'll, I'll briefly give reference to these. And, um, and sorting through the, um, the differences in notation and conventions, um, uh, differences in how certain things are termed in a way that's consistent in presenting it in a way that unpacks it a bit. So hopefully it'll be a bit less um, opaque or a bit less dense, um, require less work on your part to digest, okay? So I've, I've tried to go through the, the yeoman's work, the, the heavy lifting of, um, of, of sort of putting things into a framework that I find at once consistent uh, and uh, helpful for mnemonics um, and um, minimally confusing uh, in terms of um, giving you uh, points to hang your understanding on um, and uh, fewer, um, uh, fewer welter of details that uh, you have to keep track of. Apologies for the English lapses. Uh, so I'd like to switch to my uh, slides now and, uh, and we can uh, start going through some of the materials I prepared, uh, prepared, recognizing that this is our first traversal, traversal through a topic that uh, is gonna occupy us in one form or another for a number of, of future sessions, not necessarily contiguous future sessions, 
but we'll keep coming back like those animals to this watering hole. We'll keep using it um, to better understand uh, the, the local fauna, sometimes trek off to their, to their homes, to their layers, to their nests, uh, and, then, and then return to our, um, to our home base, as it were, of the watering hole of, of Ed Junctions. So prior to this lecture, um, I had asked you to uh, familiarize yourself with uh, a number of videos. And it was, um, you know, a, a very, very large, um, large set. Uh, and I appreciate your, your patience and dedication going through them. Um, so uh, these were of, of several different sorts, and we're going to build on several of these in coming sessions. So, um, you know, of all the materials I present, I would, um, uh, I would cede to the leadership of folks like Bartosh, um, David, David Spivak, and Brendan Fong, and Eugenia Chung, who are my superiors in, in terms of uh, grokking the material and, and really um, uh, knitting it together into a mathematically consistent framework. But as I say, I think I've, I'm, I'm trying to perform a service here by taking all their diverse notations and conventions and putting them into a more integrated, uh, consistent, and easily remembered whole. Um, so uh, Bartosz has a series of talks, and I asked you to review the first of them. We'll actually be going through two others one on uh, free forgetful functors and one on applications of adjunctions. So though that, but half of that consists of going through a helpful thinking through or review for him, um, for his, his students of, um, of uh, horizontal composition of natural transformation, something which is one of these many, many types of animals that, that shows up. Um, David Spivak and, and Brendan Fong, um, in their Seven Sketches of Compositionality, um, in, in a chapter we've looked at before, chapter three, um, have a, a, an introductory treatment to, uh, um, to naturality that, uh, excuse me, to, not, to um, adjunctions uh, in the context of data transformation, these functors associated with, uh, with databases. Um, that can be used to transform from one representation to another. And it takes it beyond the sort of simpler forms of data transformation that, that we looked at, pulling back a, um, a set of data uh, created with one functor to, to apply with another. And instead um, looks at uh, more sophisticated um, sort of considerations when it comes to uh, to an adjunction view. And uh, there's some, some real insights that can come into there, including categories of, of instances of databases where those databases are defined categorically. Um, and I asked you to look at um, uh, two modules uh, associated with uh, two different versions of their course. Um, Spivak and Fong have, have some nice materials on uh, Galois connections, which um, are a specialization of, of, of adjunctions to the case of posets or, or, or uh, pre-orders. Um, I think it'll be, um, those two are close cousins with, with one um, collapsing isomorphic objects. Um, and, uh, and those, those Galois connections will be a topic we'll go into in some more detail, both because it's, it's understandable, it gives rise to a number of, uh, of helpful uh, intuitions and examples like that one with seal, ceiling and floor being two, uh, two alternative uh, adjoint functors. Um, and, uh, and it's also a topic that has considerable relevance within computer science application, particularly in the area of compiler analysis. Finally, um, you um, met again, uh, Eugenia Chung, uh, although uh, an, an earlier incarnation of herself as a graduate student uh, presenting on adjunctions. And these are two out of a series of uh, 
five or maybe it's six, but um, series of five where uh, in, uh, in successive versions, particularly in, in, in adjunctions three, uh, you'll see her in full flight and it's, it's awesome. Um, so that's the same Eugenia Chang who gave that um, uh, category theory in real life talks that I asked you to, to look at at the opening of this discussion series. And she's absolutely uh, formidable um, as normal uh, in laying out uh, adjunctions. But her notation is, is different. Her focus is different, much less on, on, um, on applications in, in computer science. But I would thoroughly uh, recommend additional videos in that series. And, and uh, I will probably be recommending some of them. Um, so I want you to recall, before we dive into this material, a little bit about what we covered last time. Um, to wit, natural transformations. And um, rather than, than going through um, the, uh, the entirety of our coverage of that, I just want to remind you of one or two things. Uh, so natural transformations, um, we can view as constituting morphisms in a, a functor category. We can view them as mapping one functor to another. But to understand adjunctions um, to greatest effect, it bears emphasizing that a natural transformation um, will, for a given object A in, in some source category for the functor, say C, and considering two functors F and G, from C to another category D, it will, the natural transformation will serve to map how that object A is mapped by F into how that, object, uh, that object A from C is mapped by G. And so it will, it will map for each component uh, and each of its components, each component of the natural transformation written here like as alpha sub A, that's, that's the, part of the natural transformation that says how to map an object A um, from how F maps it to how G maps it, or, or, or for its component B, alpha B, from uh, how F map B to how G map B. And remember the, the intuition there, right, from Bartosz. Um, it's like saying uh, we have a pattern, C is a pattern we want to find. It's some sort of figure, stick figure. And a D finds it in two different places, a picture of a human and a picture of a, of a, of a canine. And um, we want to say, and you know, our, our natural transformation says, hey, um, this is how you go from the head of the human to the head of the dog. This is how you go from the hand of the human to the paw of the dog. This is how you go from the leg of the human to the leg of the dog. Those are the components of the natural transformation. But the, the natural transformation tells you, you know, the match, one match to, to uh, that pattern from C and another match to the pattern from C. How do you systematically map between them in a way that relates their corresponding parts? And we went through a lot of programming examples of it, 10 of them last time, um, that I won't go through, but um, it bears noting that uh, those uh, intuitions uh, end up carrying over to adjunctions. So adjunctions are legion, are legion. and, and um, Saunders McLean, um, uh, together with Eilenberg, uh, one of the uh, foremost uh, luminaries of, of category theory and, and, uh, and, and sort of expounding it in its early years and um, to this day, a towering figure, once famously commented, adjunctions are everywhere. Um, and I can vouch for you, they are. Um, I've listed but a few here um, that um, we, you know, that are closer to our areas of, of interest and application. Um, but they vary, vary from um, uh, currying, um, the ability to transfer between a you know, taking a, a pair in and, and, and having a curried function, which takes the first argument and then separately the, the second argument, something as, as prosaic, but, but uh, profound as that at, at the same time, um, to some of the topics that came up uh, in terms of the um, data, data transformation area, um, 
where there's different ways of mapping databases to each other with you know, inserting the ones that are in one into the other, or deleting um, deleting those when there's too many when, when going to the other, um, you know, so filling with nulls or, or eliminating things with nulls uh, going the other way. Um, uh, you know, there's there's this nice adjunction between the state man monad and the store co-monad that Runar talks about. And Runar's talk I thought is wonderful in terms of laying out many Many examples. There's one or two places where, um, you know, he he uh, uh, doesn't present quite the full picture uh, in terms of um, uh, of, of uh, presenting things, for example, as an isomorphism in one place. But but it's a very nice talk, excellent talk as far as motivations, as far as giving the big picture, as far as um, uh, you know, offering a a path for why this is so useful. And some creative examples that that show it that you'll find um, few few of in, in other places. It's it's really a, a great talk, um, and he he does talk about the state monad and, and store co-monad, uh, a nice example. And he also has this describe in examples, um, uh, very creative uh, uh, notion in, in his talk uh, involving posets, uh, partially partially ordered sets. That um, that is, it provides an example of um, Galois connections uh, as, as a specialization of that junction. Um, and, but we see many others uh, of these as well. Um, meets and joins, um, um, things that are limits and co-limits, like products and co-products um, uh, end up being folded very nicely into to adjunctions. Um, uh, free monads um, and underlying functors, um, these monads that, that don't commit to a certain set of rules um, and, and just keep, as it were, recording kind of what applicate, what, um, what, um, uh, what, what uh, operations are performed uh, without collapsing them down are, are a great example of where um, uh, adjunctions come in because you have a a junction between them and underlying functors. Uh, one example I do have laid in this lecture, we may or may not get to it, concerns uh, also this element of, of free forgetful functors. And it's between free monoids, which we talked about in some of our opening uh, lecture lectures and underlying sets. And if we don't get to it in earnest today, we will next time and as we go through a set of examples. Uh, Runar has in his uh, talk this nice example of pointed types and underlying types, which end up kind of reinventing uh, uh, the uh, maybe uh, monad, um, which can be used to add a, a pointed type to, to any type. And David Spivak has commented on this underlying adjunction between polynomial rings and underlying sets, uh, which uh, you know I'm interested in. in potential relevance and uh, uh, fully homomorphic encryption. Okay, so um, I mentioned this notion of a watering hole and, and adjunctions uh, have this way of, of linking up with countless different or you know, very large numbers of different, um, uh, different topics within category theory. And I've listed many of them here. Um, one of the reasons I'm covering this now is because it provides uh, a rather nice uh, kind of way of reflecting on uh, some of the foundational materials we've covered, this triad that has supported us and that we've uh, gone through. So functors, categories, natural transformations, naturality. Um, these are all central to the definition of adjunctions and reflecting in adjunctions hopefully will help you sort of understand their relevance, but uh, maybe even deepen your intuition for them. Uh, There's some components of these that I haven't dwelt on, um, but which we'll need to visit sometime. Uh, and 
And uh, for example, um, composition of natural transformations is not something we've, we've discussed um, within our coverage of it. And it turns out there's two types of ways of composing them, horizontal and vertical. And it turns out horizontal nat uh, composition of natural transformations will be uh, quite central um, in understanding some of the basic laws associated with adjunctions. Um, we'll see that uh, in this session. And, uh, and we'll, we'll probably revisit uh, those, those uh, compositions and, and composition rules in the next few lectures because uh, we, we need to, to understand that better. Uh, monads are at, at the heart of, of adjunctions. Um, every adjunction gives rise to a monad. And every monad is defined through one or more adjunctions, so typically through multiple ones with, uh, for example, Cleisley category and eilenberg moore category providing alternative, um, alternative constructs for coming up with monads. You could typically have more than one adjunction that can give rise to a given monad. Um, and you will see monadic constructs popping out of the very definitions of adjunctions. There's a monad right there. It'll be, it'll be a monad and unit um, in a monad return will, will pop out of the definition of adjunction. Um, it, it possibly stares you in the face. Uh, and one of the big reasons for this is we're dealing with endofunctors. And when we're dealing with endofunctors, functors from a category to itself, monoids um, come into play. And, and the very notion of unit is a monoidal notion. It's the unit of a monoid. It's the, the element where if you multiply it, remember monoids are about, about multiplication of, of elements or, or multiplication, uh, there's, a, there's a binary operation on elements. And uh, by default, we might refer to it as multiplication, mu. Um, and one of the features of a monoid is there's this unit that if you, Combine it with this binary operation with any other element on either side, it will give the same other element back. And, um, and that's what pops out of an adjunction's very definition. Uh, the very first definition we'll see, it'll, it'll come out of there. Contravariance and covariance come in, particularly in the context of Hom profunctors, um, which, which make uh, an appearance. And we'll see contravariance appearing in the context of reasoning about naturality. Um, it also has some relevance in adjunctions involving pair. Uh, and it turns out the thing called representable functors um, uh, also, um, also will appear. There's this area I've kind of been gun shy about um, uh, about uh, drawing into this discussion group for not wanting to overwhelm people and because it uh, it can be hard to motivate quite as much. Um, but I think we'll eventually have to get around to it, which has to do with this notion of universal constructions, okay? Um, universal constructions find the best um, thing in a, in a, uh, in a, in a category, for example, or a diagram, uh, with the best example of something. Um, and it might be, for example, the very uh, topmost of the elements or the uh, greatest, uh, the least upper bound of a set of elements, et cetera. And there are many, um, there are many cases where we wanna reason about universal constructions associated with, um, with different sorts of situations that give rise to very useful concepts, uh, limits and, and co-limits and products and co-products as examples, the exponential object. Um, uh, and these turn out to be, give re some very nice examples for adjunctions. Um, and adjunctions can be used as an alternative to a rather, um, manual construction of, of sort of factorization associated with universal constructions. 
and, and, and you can see these universal constructions kind of popping out of adjunctions uh, in a way that's, that's quite nice, um, aesthetically pleasing compared to you know, building them up from scratch. I mentioned Galois connections of, as relevant um, within uh, abstract interpretation, for example, compilers, um, and and it provides this this basis um, for uh, for reasoning in the context of these uh, posets, uh, partially ordered sets, free constructs, uh, so free monads, free monoids, uh, free categories, etc. You can. Um, you can come up with uh, within the context of adjunctions very nicely because there's this um, relationship with free and forgetful functors and and it, it, it produces um, free versions of constructs like a free monoid where we talk about free meaning m that there's minimal restrictions in place only the restrictions enforced by the very definition of a category involving identity and associativity, for example. Um, this notion of free uh, turns out to be very useful. Um, and just as free monads offer some great value, look at the IO monad, um, you, you, can, um, you can use it in many constructs in a useful way. And if, you're, if you wanna understand other areas like, um, uh, like Levere theories, uh, understanding free concept or uh, free constructs is is really um, uh, required and and very useful. Um, Eugenia Chung's uh, presentation, I believe, uh, adjunctions two talked about two categories very briefly, and it turns out that um, there's areas of, of category theory where uh, you know we go beyond the the, the notion of, of, of categories and functors, uh, excuse me, categories uh, as having objects and morphisms. Um, and um, and we, we start to think about, say, a category of small categories as involving additional um, constructs. We, we start elaborating it with, um, say, uh, uh, not just functors between categories, but natural transformations as well. And there's this notion of cell, zero cell, one cell, two cell, et cetera, uh, that you can build up of these different types of transformations. And indeed, there's infinity categories um, that uh, Emily Riel has some nice videos on. So n categories, um, uh, n, n, category, uh, n category theoretic notation can be useful to illustrate adjunctions as, um, uh, as Eugenia Chung uh, illustrates. Um, some issues with of duality, co-product and product, often you get these really nice um, uh, adjunctions where um, you, you have a given functor and if it's left a joint, you get X and if it's Y, uh, y adjoint, it has, it has uh, uh, another adjoint and and those uh, end up having some nice relationship with like products and co-products, for example, with the diagonal functor. Um, Pre-orders and post-sets come into Galois connection. Uh, and in software engineering, adjunctions can be extremely useful um, for their relationship with these items. And also for, for capturing higher level structure where one sphere is, is kind of a systematic, um, um, transformation of another. And there are these um, relationships of consistency maintained between those two that need to be maintained between the two sides. Um, and uh, there's many cases of this where you have two sides which are um, which are basically mirrors of each other, but um, not the same. And one is, is um, has a systematic, each has a systematic relationship to one another. And uh, adjunctions provide a way of nicely characterizing this relationship. You know, Runar also talks more deeply, and I have some things to learn from him on, on adjunctions capturing solutions to problems. And 
you know, as, as um, allowing us to express the hardest problem that can be solved by a given solution. And on the other hand, the, the, the optimal solution to a given problem. And, um, you know, I think uh, while there's some intuitions behind that, um, I, I uh, don't, that I appreciate, I, um, I'm looking to, to learn more about that perspective and adjunctions. Um, for using them to, to problem solve uh, more generally on, on problems. And I, I think he's probably right that, that there is this deeper notion, but he's thought about it obviously a lot more than I have, and I have a lot to learn from him. And I'm grateful for his talk for laying, laying that tantalizing possibility out. Okay, so we're, gonna, um, we're going to have a, a journey through here that will last many lectures. Um, Again, not necessarily a continuous way. We're gonna start with some motivations. Uh, I've, I've kind of done that. Uh, we're going to then put into a common context uh, set of notation. And one of my biggest goals here is that if you were to go look at these talks, you would end up with at least three different conventions for characterizing adjunctions. Um, uh, and, and it's not just that different letters, you know, for naming things. There's that, you know, uh, that, that, you know, Eugenia Chung uses F and G, where Bartosz uh, and myself use L and R, for example. Um, but it's also that the um, C and D categories are flipped uh, and, it, it altogether makes for some confusing inconsistencies if you try to make sense of what you hear in one talk in light of another. And there's also some very challenging notation that can come up. Um, and you'll see, it, you'll see it very impressively deployed by Eugenia Chung in some of her videos. Um, and if you, if you really want to hoot, watch, watch her at Junctions 3 and 4. Um, where, where she is just awesome. Um, but she's extremely quick in writing these things down and recognizing patterns in ways that um, you know, mere mortals have trouble keeping up with. And um, it, it actually doesn't require godlike understanding. It, it, um, uh, the truth is, uh, it's just the notation is very terse and often, often not explained. And so we're gonna look at some um, some notation that that unpacks some of that. And I'm gonna to try to walk you through two alternative characterizations uh, of, uh, of adjunctions, uh, each of which you'll find very widespread. Um, and each of which has a lot to recommend it as kind of a basis for understanding, but which initially as Eugenia Chung comments, look like they have no obvious relationship to one another. But you'll, you'll start to see, it's kind of like seeing the watering hole at night and during the day. It's two sides of the same environment, somewhat different animals that come into play to understand it. But you'll, um, you, you'll end up seeing there's uh, a lot more commonality there than is, than is obvious at first. And so we'll go through those two obvious characterizations and try to knit them together a bit. Um, I'm hoping it, it probably it won't occur this time in its fulsomeness, but there's this gorgeous um, um, linkage between this stuff and monads and co-monads. And you'll see that in, in coming minutes uh, at its most basic with unit and co-unit and, and so on. And you'll see actually um, co-monads, but it turns out like in terms of um, the definition of monads and co-monads and the monadic laws, um, there's a bit more work to do. And Eugenia Chung uh, does that in, in adjunctions three and four, I think, with in the most impressive display of virtuosity that, that I've, I've uh, uh, one of the most impressive I've seen in the past year, certainly. Um, and uh, we'll unpack that more. And we're gonna go deep into monads and uh, also you know, substantially into co-monads with adjunctions as a base. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll go back and forth between them because they're joined at the hip. Um, and then I'm probably gonna have 
a lecture just devoted to Galois connections, uh, which have this great importance in computer science and compilers and, um, and, and great intuitions associated with them. Um, the, in the Azimuth Forum, there's some great discussion by, on this by John Buys. And then free forgetful functors, uh, we're going to probably have at least one or two lectures on because uh, they are incredibly useful, incredibly common, um, and link in with, with a lot of additional constructs. Um, uh, so a lot of, lot of additional concerns, including free monads. OK. Um, so the water hole, ladies and gentlemen, the water hole. Um, uh, let's talk about the basic situation being illustrated by an adjunction. And I'm going to try to introduce some elements of notation that I will keep throughout our coverage throughout uh, this uh, discussion group. So we're going to have a category C and a category D, where D um, will have a functor L that goes from D to C. So we show C on the left here. And that functor L points left. Yes, left. Um, and uh, the directionality of the left functor is shown. I've shown two different conventions for indicating it. When I say conventions here, I mean, there's two different ways of diagrammatically indicating which is the left functor. One of them shows an arrow, a big arrow. Um, and that points in the direction of the left functor, OK? Um, so people put down an arrow and say, hey, the left one is this one. Um, uh, alternatively, and Eugenia Chung uses this notation, and it's very, very, very common. You use a turnstile operator, and the pointy end of the wedge, kind of like the pointy end of a warthog, it points at the L functor, OK, um, and away from the R functor. Uh, very common, you'll see this put on its side. You'll write L and the pointy end pointing towards it, um, and then the turnstile, and then R on the flat side of it. Okay, um, so you'll, you'll write it in line like that, and that will indicate L is the left functor. Um, but using L, I think, is, is a nice notation. Now, it turns out uh, David Spivak and Brendan Fong have this, but I think C and D are flipped. Um, so you have D on the left, but um, at least in, in one of the, the coverages I saw by them. But L will be uh, left functor, R will be right functor, R goes, and the point is L and R go um, between these two categories in opposite ways. L goes D to C and R goes C to, C to D, okay? Um, they're, they're pair. And uh, if they were an isomorphism, um, you know, they'd be inverses of each other, so to speak. But um, they're not. They're just um, uh, kind of like uh, inverses. They're, they're, but they, they, they are not, not, not full inverses. Now, you'll notice, um, and this is something that, that uh, Bartosz comments on, uh, in that introductory video, um, and also David Spivak and, and Brendan Fong. Look, this is an asymmetric situation. It's easy to kind of say, oh, look at the, the symmetries. And there are some symmetries, but there's also a broken symmetry here. Um, you know, if, if you were to um, flip this on, you know, by 180 degrees, it wouldn't look the, the, the same. Um, and specifically, you might expect one of these um, uh, HOM sets, such as this one in C from LD to C, to be in the opposite direction of that from RC to, to D. But you'll notice they both come down. So adjunctions are an asymmetric concept. It's not the same. Uh, you know, the left and the right functor are not the same. And in fact, like the left functor will always be the free functor and the R functor will be the underlying functor when we come to free forgetful functors. Uh, uh, yeah, free forgetful functors. R will be the forgetful or underlying functor in most cases. It says the underlying set for a monoid, for example. 
So, um, so they're, they are not symmetric, even though you might um, see a certain mirror-like quality here, they're not, not exactly symmetric, okay? Um, but let's, let's, let's unpack this a little bit more. Um, okay, so we have in D an object C, okay? And the left functor L maps it into LD, which is in C category C, okay? So it maps from this object in D into this object LD and, and C, right? That's what functors do. They map between two categories. Um, so that's LD over here. And we might, by contrast, have some arbitrary object C. D is in, was an arbitrary object in, in capital D, in, in category D. C is an arbitrary object in C. And, um, we could consider the set of all morphisms, a HOM set between LD, the result of mapping D with L, um, and, and C, and this arbitrary C. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that HOM set will have a you know, certain, uh, certain set of morphisms. Um, if those are functions, as they would be in, if C were Hask, those might be a set of different functions between two data types, between you know int and double, for example. Uh, if if C were a preorder uh, or C were a post set, this might be one or zero morphisms, right? Um, uh, maybe it's uh, maybe it's something indicating LD is less than or equal to C. Um, but uh, you know there could be, uh, in general, for categories zero or more morphisms there. Now C is an arbitrary object in, in C, but we could map it with R because functors map all objects of the source category into some some um, object R C over here in D, and we could consider the the hum set between that original object D in, in RC. And one of the definitions that we'll be visiting for adjunctions is one that relates these two set of, of um, these two HOM, HOM sets, these, the, the correspondence between those here in D and those over here in C. And uh, in an adjunction, they're isomorphic. And it turns out it's more than isomorphic. They're naturally isomorphic, but um, uh, we'll unpack that a bit too. Um, so uh, in an adjunction, we are reasoning about the relationship between the, the hum sets in these two categories in the context of these sort of situations, of an asymmetric situation where we have two functors going between those two categories and fundamentally, we're reasoning about the structure of these two categories and about it, the similarity in that structure between those two categories. And, and as it turns out, it's, it's a weakening of, of isomorphism. We're not saying that they are the same. We're not saying that they are purely isomorphic. We are saying that, however, that they have some sort of structured relationship to one another which is uh, principled and deep. Okay, so let's, let's um, um, maybe I'll just ask, are there any questions about this basic diagram and the notation here? Okay, um, nothing? Okay, I, I'll just make one or two additional remarks. It bears noting in a programming context that C and D could be the same category. There's nothing preventing that at all. Um, uh, so D and C might be Hask, for example, that um, quasi category. Um, they might, um, uh, they, they, you know, uh, one functor might map to a subset of Hask, uh, for example, 
um, of the other. Um, and the other might might map uh, map, map back to the to the entirety of, of Hask or what have you, or, or to a to a large set of, of Hask. Um, it also is worth really, really emphasizing that L and R here are not inverses of each other, but they they have a little bit of that flavor, that tantalizing smell. And specifically, L does go from D to C, and R goes from C to D. And we could imagine round-tripping them. This, this one shows you know, R is coming from a, um, a different object, C, than, than is the, the image of, of L. But, you know, if we were to think about it um, more in, in more of a round trip way, we might have D get to L and then back uh, via R to RLD. And as we'll see, this will, this will specify a unit of a, of a monad, uh, associated with this. And it's a unit of a, of a monoid um, as well. A monoid in the category of endopunctors um, where, where RL is, and this is what I want to emphasize, an endopunctor. Okay, now that's a fancy term. What, what do I mean by RL as an endopunctor? Well, what I mean is um, if, if we first go with L, so this RL is, I should really have written, and I stand or sit corrected should be R composed with L just to make it explicit. I'm, I'm lapsing into category theoretic uh, terse notation here. So first we have uh, L, so we're starting in D. We have to be starting in D, we couldn't apply L. We go on L and then we do R, right? And guess what? We're back in D. We started in D, we ended up in D. It's a functor from D to D. The composition of these is a function from D to D. Um, just like we can compose morphisms, remember we can compose functors. After all, functors are morphisms in a category of small categories, for example. Um, and we can compose them. So we can do one after the other as long as they are compatible, as long as you know they can be ended, lined up uh, end to end. Um, as long as the the uh, the the, the uh, codomain of, of L is the same as the domain of R, we can apply L first and then apply R. So this is an endofunctor. R L is an endofunctor in D. Similarly, L R is an endofunctor in C. Right? Okay. Let's just trace that back. If we start with an arbitrary object C and we do R, we get to RC. And then suppose we do L, we get to LRC. And guess what? We're back in C. We've round tripped it, right? Um, and the net result is we have a mapping from C to C. And south of the border, they might say C to shining C. But it's, um, it's, a, it's an endofunctor because uh, you put these together uh, and you'll get a, a functor mapping from C to C. This functor, LR, lives in C. This, this endofunctor lives in C. RL lives in D. It maps from D to D. LR maps from C to C, okay? Um, but they're endofunctors each in their own category, okay? This will be key because we're going to be seeing them a lot. Those will be our friends. And in fact, right there, that's a monad. It's a monad. RL is a monad, okay? It's an endofunctor. And as a monoid in the category of endofunctors, um, it's a monad. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a co-monad. But um, we'll come to make their acquaintance later. Um, okay. Um, so... We're gonna go through two definitions here of adjunction, which turn out to be equivalent, even though they look very different. It's the watering hole in the day and the watering hole at night. Okay, definition one, basically harks back to the motivation, which is used by 
in, in, in great ways by uh, my superiors, uh, Yudin Chung and Bartosz Miluski, each in their own way to motivate as the entry point for, these, uh, for this material. And basically what they appeal to um, is, is you know, a desire for a notion of similarity of categories that is at once rich, insightful, um, and uh, and you know amenable to to uh, uh, to, to real mathematical substance, uh, but is a far cry removed from just uh, simple equality, uh, which is too rigid, or as Eugenia Chong comments, at um, uh, unimaginative. Um, so we're 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 seeking some sort of relaxed notion of saying, look, this, this category is similar to this other one. And there's lots of practical reasons for this. I think those would have been foremost in Bartosz's mind um, uh, and, and perhaps in Eugenius as well, because she has a very, uh, very pract extraordinarily practical side, as you know, from how to bake pie and, and her other uh, uh, diverse contributions, including how to, how to develop the, the ideal cream for scones. Um, Okay, um, scones, as they should be called, I think, in Scotland. Um, so here we're seeking um, uh, a way of, of reasoning about similar categories, because in a lot of real world contexts, we don't have perfect crystalline, um, uh, you know, uh, identity or equality between things. Rather, we have things that are like each other, and we want a rigorous way of, of capturing that fact that they are like each other and in a software context in computer science maintaining that relationship that integrity of that relationship between the two without forcing them into exactly the same mold um, recognizing that they, they have this salient similarity um, and not just dealing with it in a boilerplate way but rather in a way that explicitly captures what's similar and dis uh, distinguishes it from what's different between the two. You can get tremendous economies of, of specification um, and uh, separation of concerns by so doing in software. Um, so that, in, in my mind, that's a lot of the, the motivation here. And I think they do a good job of, of motivating it. Um, and you know, in this context, we have these complementary actions of these functors mapping back and forth between them. And uh, we're reasoning about the similarity of these two categories through these functors. Um, and so while the definitions may be about the functors, it bears in noting that really a lot of what we're talking about is the structure of the categories being similar here, okay? And um, uh, I, I noted uh, the basic setup and that LR is an endofunctor in C uh, because L goes, uh, this is L after R, R is going C to D, and L is going D to C, and so we end up round tripping to C. Okay, now, uh, as Eugenia lays it out um, in uh, adjunctions one, um, in her inimitable style, um, uh, identity uh, would be defined if, if you just, if you just, uh, said L after R is uh, gives the identity, that would be saying that the two categories are isomorphic or R after L is the identity in D, uh, L after R would be the identity of C. R and L here would be inverses of one another. And you know, that's, that's interesting. Um, C and D are really the, the same category up to relabeling. Um, but it's, it's, not, it's not all that that uh, insightful and, and it's kind of rigid. Um, equivalence wouldn't be saying that they're equal to identity, but they're they're equivalent to identity. It's just uh, you know it's a matter of, of relabeling them. They they may not map back to exactly the same object by doing R first and then L. You don't may not get back to the same object C. Um, but maybe you get back to something that's isomorphic to it. And, um, and adjunction takes that one step further. Um, 
it it basically lays out a situation where you have a natural transformation um, that links up identity in D um, to RL. So instead of it just being isomorphic to it, instead of it being equal to it, there's, there's some sort of natural transformation, some sort of thing of this sort that maps between them. And remember we saw in our last lecture, the natural transformations when they occur, I mean, they're a, they're a very strong, a very strong, um, um, a very, you know, very, very strong fact if you have a natural transformation between functors. It doesn't say um, uh, that, excuse me, between two, um, uh, yes, it's between two functors, ID functor and RL um, as, a, as a functor. It doesn't say they're precisely the same. One could collapse, um, for example, but it says that um, they have to have some deep fundamental similarity on how they handle things across the board for them to have this natural transformation between. They need to be consistent across the board with respect to a lot of different um, handling of all these different situations because it's quantified over, um, over you know, all of these possible um, functions or morphisms here. Um, okay, um, so the idea here is that instead of it being equal to that, we have a, uh, a natural transformation. And as Eugenia said, you know, these are chosen in an artful way. Um, we, we choose L to R to map to, um, to this functor and, and mapping from the identity functor. Now, again, it, it, it behooves us to be very clear about what we're dealing with. R after L, is an endo functor, right? Um, it's an endo functor in D. It's this a composition of two functors. A natural transformation goes between functors. It goes from how one functor maps an object to how another functor maps an object across all objects. Um, so for A, it says how F maps A to how G maps A. For B, it says how F maps B to G, how G maps B. And so there's got to be some particular mapping that says for each object of D, um, how do we map from identity on D, in other words, D, into R after L, okay? Um, and for L after R, how do we map each particular value um, as mapped by that into this value in um, C it by itself. So this is in C. So how do we map from L after R on C into C? Uh, so that's what these natural transformations give. And those of you familiar with monads should start to smell a monad here. We're mapping D to RLD. Uh, if RL is, is combined, that that looks like a monad. It looks like you're inserting it into a monad where RL is, is a monad. And indeed, that's what, what it is. So eta will be the unit uh, and um, epsilon here will be the, uh, the co-unit, which is a co-unit of a, of a co-monad. Um, okay, so let's, um, let, let's you know, revisit the, the diagrams we saw earlier. And what you'll realize here is that these are depicting unit and co-unit. So um, just as a reminder, unit goes from ID and D, that's D, and it, it's going to map it to, to L and then R, right? Um, L and then R, where, where it's mapped through that. And we have to have a mapping between the two for our natural transformation. Remember the natural transformation back here maps how it's mapped by one functor to how it's mapped by a different functor for a given object. D is our object and we're mapping from, excuse me, D is our object, we're mapping from how the identity functor maps it, which is just D to D, that's what this one is right here. And we're mapping it to how R after L maps it. And that's, uh, that's how that functor maps it. So R after L is an endo functor in D that maps from D to D. And so we're mapping here, we're, we're saying, this is our natural transformation. This is 
eta sub d, and eta is this natural transformation. And eta has the, the um, name unit because it's the unit of a monoid. Um, it turns out this is a monoid and there's a beautiful result uh, by which you can show that. We'll probably show it next time. But if you consider, um, consider uh, these and, and multiplying by them, you'll, you'll, you'll put RL, RL and the, the uh, L from here and the R from the next R collapse down. And uh, essentially you can get a rule for turning that into RL. Um, so it's multiplying RL times RL to get RL um, in a really nice way by taking into account uh, the, uh, the co-unit here to map it down to, uh, to identity. So this is an element of our natural transformation, okay? Um, uh, and that element is an element therefore of unit. Eta is unit. Um, similarly, we have epsilon, which is co-unit. Here's, here's epsilon, okay. We're starting over here. Let's get my head out of the way. It's, gets me in trouble all the time. Um, okay, so, so we're starting with C. Remember, LR is an endofunctor in C. Um, we first do R and then we do L. It's L after R, that's how to read that, right? Um, L after R. So we start with R and then we do L. R starts with, with C, so we, well, we do R and then we do L and we end up back in C. Oh my gosh, we're back in C. Uh, so it's an endofunctor in C, right? And we're mapping here from from things uh, as they would be mapped by the endofunctor, that endofunctor, L after R, into as they would be mapped by the identity endofunctor in C. Identity endofunctor in C just maps C to C. Um, and uh, LR, uh, by contrast, maps it to LRC, kind of by definition. And um, the natural transformation from one to the other, whoa, um, here, that's what that double arrow is, it's a natural transformation. It will, it will map from LRC to C, that's one component of it. Um, uh, epsilon sub LRC, that's, that's, um, excuse me, that should be epsilon, C, that should be epsilon C, um, yeah, um, because we're considering how it's mapped by this one versus how it's mapped by that one. So that should be epsilon C, I, I miswrote that. Um, so that's just a component of our natural transformation, how um, it's mapped by LR versus how it's mapped by identity. Um, um, and identity is just C itself, uh, how it's mapped by LR is LRC, and we've got this uh, natural transformation here, epsilon sub C, despite the name, ignore the name. Um, okay, um, so these are our, our two natural transformations uh, between these, and we use those instead of imposing equality, instead of imposing isomorphism, all we need is a natural transformation. We need some way of, of going from, from one to the other that's natural, natural in, in all that sense we saw last time. Um, and the fact that we can do that so systematically, oh, I made myself disappear, um, made myself, uh, so um, the fact that we can do it so systematically um, if, if there is this adjunction, it's telling us something pretty, um, uh, you know, that there's, uh, uh, that there's uh, something here between identity on C and the round trip that's pretty consistent. In other words, going the round trip somehow preserves important properties of D here 
or of C here. Going on that round trip, somehow it may not be the same as getting back to the same point. It may not be we leave from C and come back to C, but we're ending up in some place that's that you know is 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 consistent. It it it's mapping us to a place that um, if we go round trip um, is pre pretty similar to uh, to where we we started or has some some broad structural similarities. So we have these natural transformations between these. Okay, um, and that also tells us it tells us something about these round trip functors. They preserve it, but it tells us something about C and D too, that they are they are somehow fairly similar. So that's uh, this basic um, notion here. Now, there's a part I haven't talked about yet, in which you probably don't, your heart doesn't leap at exploring, which is the triangle e uh, equalities. But they're actually a lot of fun. Um, but before I, I I jump into the triangle equalities and the um, oh my. Gosh, this should say um, definition two. Before we get into definition two, um, are there any questions about what I've already uh, covered here in terms of these basics and in terms of these, uh, these essential diagrams? Any questions on what I've covered thus far? Uh, so if... Uh like a, a functor maps objects to objects and morphisms to morphisms, right? Yeah. So should, and it applies uh, to the whole category. So, yeah. and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm just trying to summarize my understanding of it. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so like R, for example, should also map each of those uh, morphisms in C to something in D. Yeah. And it should correct. also map L, D to something. That's correct. In D. That is right. And we're just not drawing it for clarity. That's right. And that That's right. It's, it's, this is purely to keep the focus for the student on what's going on with the appointed objects, but there's going to be systematic mapping here going on from, you know, each of these morphisms, each of these objects over in C is going to be mapped into something over here in, in D. And, and likewise, L is going to map each object in D to something over in C as well, right? Um, but the way in which the, um, uh, the, the way in which, uh, you know, I'm trying to lay it out is uh, such that we can trace like what's the effect of uh, L after R here. So if we consider, for example, L after R, you know, here we'll, we'll be racing through kind of the, the life of C, you know, how C is mapped. It's mapped to RC and then to LRC, and it has a, a cycle associated with it. Um, and similarly, sorry for um, for this one here. And I'm trying to keep that that focus there. Now, when it comes to this, um, this is actually an adaptation of a later slide, uh, which is going to emphasize the fundamental similarities for any C and any any C and C, any D and D. Um, not the game, but uh, the, the, the D in, in the D category, um, we get this, um, this relationship. So it's kind of like you can pick any C you want, you can pick any D you want, and there's guaranteed to be this systematic similarity between these so-called HOM sets um, for how D is mapped to the image of C in D and how how uh, you know C is mapped to from the image of of D and, and D via L, um, you you have this uh, similarity, and what that's telling you is that um, you know wherever you look in the categories, whatever C, whatever D, you've got this correspondence between the two, um, 
that uh, that that indicates the structural similarity uh, of the categories, and that's going to um, be a testimonial to kind of how how they have similar structure. But in order to illustrate it, you you want to you know emphasize um, okay what what how is a C mapped? How is a D mapped? But yes, all of these other objects are mapped to somewhere, and those would be, you know, different C's. Um, you know, LD could be picked as a C uh, later, um, and these morphisms are also mapped over, and they have to be mapped over into corresponding, you know, to go in between um, corresponding points as mapped by R, for example. It's just um, in in trying to present the um, the rules for adjunctions and the motivation, I've simply stripped that away. I don't know if that's helpful. Yeah, yes, it is. Thank you. Okay. Uh, great question, though. Great question. Other questions right now on what I've covered thus far? Well, I guess maybe just a quick follow up to that. Like, uh, if we look at the diagram again, please. Yeah, this one, or or this one. This one. So I guess what the one of the key points should be that if we round trip, if we say we start at at lowercase c, and we round trip through r, and then l. That would be, I think, that, this this one, Wade, maybe like this. Yeah, okay, yeah. So I guess it's is it key that you don't get back necessarily to lowercase c? Yeah. But it could be, but that would be a stronger assertion yeah. that we yeah. haven't discussed yet. Precisely. Um that would be um th this. Um, can you see my mouse? Yes. Okay. So, so if you were to go, if you were to have L after R B, B I D of, of C, so that would mean you go from C back to C, um, by, by round tripping here R and L be inverses of one another, wherever you, you go to with R, you'd, L would undo it and get back to C, right? Um, it would it would bring you back home, um, uh, bring you back, and um, and you know that that's a very strong condition uh, on those. And um, you know, one of my small critiques of Runar's talk is at one point he 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 does say like. The two functors equal the uh, composed equals uh, identity, and and that's not that's not actually quite true. Um, it, this is that that's a much stronger guarantee if they're inverses of each other, and you can get that in some cases. I mean, there are some interesting cases where they're inverses of each other, where one undoes the other, um, and um, you know you you might have something like. Um, uh, a list of either's uh, is an either of a list or something like of, of two lists. Um, uh, and, 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 and that's, that's interesting, but that's a, a very strong, strong, strong condition that they're exactly the same. Um, whereas we have something that's looser, but still guarantees um, some impressive amount of similarity. Um, and you're going to see in a few minutes, no pun intended, um, uh, the, you know, why, it, why it's actually so strong a condition. Like right now, it may seem kind of disconnected. You're like, okay, it goes round trip, but it, it doesn't get back to it. And, and you know, there's there's got to be at least one morphism between them because there's got to be a natural transformation between them. Remember, natural transformations don't have to exist between two arbitrary functors. 
So, you know, if these were bad functors, badly behaved functors, um, um, you know, they, they, they didn't map back to a good point. There might be no mapping between LRC and C at all, no morphism, you know, uh, you know, L might map back to, to kind of some forsaken solitude and, and there's no morphism out of it, um, you know, then, then there's no natural transformation between them. So the fact that there is a natural transformation between them, um, or excuse me, it, well, it's a strong condition and you'll see additionally how strong it is um, in, um, in, a little, in a little bit. It partly comes out of these triangle laws, but, um, but where it'll start to probably sink in more is this isomorphism between home sets, which um, sounds a bit disconnected, but, but actually is a very strong condition. And we'll go through some thought experiments to sort of talk about this. I don't know if that's helpful. Yes, thank you. Additional questions? Okay, so maybe I'll go on. So the part you often don't see talked about within programming um, context of this are the triangle inequality, the triangle equalities. And um, to their credit, Bartosz unpacks this a great deal. Eugenia, Eugenia Chung, you know, uh, reflective of the, the small amount of time that they have for their bite-sized talks, their nuggets. She just whips through it um, with uh, aplomb and speed uh, and, um, and uh, for someone who's more versed in the, the notation, it can be very eye-opening, but um, you got to really, it's kind of like watching a, um, a cheetah come to drink at the watering hole and then bound off at the greatest of speeds. Uh, so, um, uh, so here, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I've tried to put, like if, if you think through the triangle equalities, um, um, it can be useful for understanding the notation that someone like Eugenia uses and Bartosz will end up using after explaining it a bit. Um, but it's also just helpful for unpacking what's going on. And I found it helpful to refer back to these diagrams. So instead of flipping back and forth, I just said, what the heck, I'm gonna put them on this, I'm gonna put all three of these diagrams here. And it will remind me at a glance you know, for example, that um, uh, what, what a round trip uh, looks like uh, here. And, you know, remind me, for example, uh, so L after R, so R and then L um, brings me back to C. Um, uh, and and that, that can be useful for my, um, for my thinking uh, about, about the, um, the relationships here. Okay, um, so uh, we're just going to to uh, have some reminders here about some of the basics. What's, uh, you know, that like R after L is an endofunctor in D, that is it maps D to D, L after R maps C to C, um, eta maps ID in D. So this is the natural, the natural transformation between the identity functor on D mapping D to D, literally like the D object to the D object, the some morphism to the same morphism. Um, and, and this is a natural transformation to this functor R after L. Um, okay, so we quick with that, let's look at these triangle equalities and you need them for this definition. This by itself is not enough. You gotta have the triangle equalities. Um, and the triangle equalities um, end up being tied up with the monad laws 
for the underlying monads. And um, uh, you could see Eugenia getting rather excited about some, some facts having to do with that in some of the later videos. Um, it's a lot of, a lot of fun. Um, okay, so, so let's just talk about what these equalities show. Um, I've tried to unpack them into less dense notation. And Bartosz does a, a, a good job of explanation of this as well. Um, okay, so the triangle equalities show a correspondence between functors, okay? And they're commuting diagrams, meaning we're trying to show if we go this way or we go these way, this way, uh, we get back to this to the same point, okay? And by the way, mathematicians have a have a, in my view, a somewhat bizarre notation of liking to draw these long parallel lines. And I thought, like, what is that long parallel line? That's a weird convention. And then I realized with a certain amount of shock um, that it's a long equality sign. <laughs> I think this is an equality sign, which is just, you know, strange, strangely distended. Okay, so um, what this is saying, though, basically is if you go around um, the, the, you know, go this way and then down, you'll get to the same point as, as down here, okay? Um, and um, the way it will be written uh, by... Um, by in, in terms of notation is shown down here at the left, but they would actually leave out these compose signs, which which leads to even more confusion when you try to read the handwriting. Sometimes you can't tell what's subscripted and what's just next to each other, et cetera. So I've tried to, to be careful about this. Okay, look. Um, so suppose we have a functor R. We have a functor R, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, so, um, Okay, now, now, uh, did I did I screw something uh, up? Yes, this should be. Oh my God! Okay, this is horrible. So this should be. What's wrong with this, ladies and gentlemen? Take, tell me what's wrong with this uh, right here. I know immediately something's off base, and I know immediately what the problem is, and I know how to correct it. But, um, but what? Why can this not be the case? Uh, I defunctor on D, followed by uh, excuse me. Uh, no, 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 it is. It's fine. Okay. Okay. I'm just misreading it. Sorry. So this is okay. So we have our functor going first, right? Um, so it's IDD after R. So we have R going and then we have IDD. Um, so that's the ID functor in D and it will leave us in D. Okay. So that's, that's a functor. And uh, this is a, um, a functor which is going to have started in C, go to D with R and stay in D because here's IDD, right? Um, yeah. Okay. So if we have this functor, um, we can apply a natural transformation to each of these components. Now, technically, this is called horizontal horizontal composition of natural transformations, but don't go out and study Bartosz's talk on that yet, because you could just think of it applying piecewise here. Eta, what does eta do? Eta applies to what? Who can tell me? Eta eats what? What does it, what does it do? It transforms what into what? Here's eta. Here's your little, little crib sheet. What does eta do? It takes in a what? What does it eat? It takes in a ID of D. ID of D. Okay. And and it produces an RL. So it it turns an ID of D. It consumes an ID of D. Um and it maps it over via this natural transformation. That's the double arrows into an RL. So there's your RL that's produced from it. And that's why I put it in in this um, highlighted green color. So eta consumes IDD and turns it into an RL. R 
it turns out, and I, I really should have probably written this out more. R as a natural transformation is really identity. Okay, so it's leaving an R as an R. It's an identity on, 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 on R. It's just the identity natural transformation. And I, I should have written one sub R here. So I, I, I'm, I'm a bad boy and I, let me just write it. Uh, it's, it's one sub, sub R, okay? So, so there, um, it makes me feel a little bit better. Um, uh, one sub R, okay? So this is the identity natural transformation. Oh my gosh on R, so it maps R to R. So it doesn't change R, it just leaves R. That's what that R is, okay? Um, uh, so together, these R produced by that, no pun intended. So eta consumes this uh, ID of D and produces the RL. This, this identity natural transformation, remember natural transformation maps from a functor to a functor, this, takes in an R and produces an R. It just leaves it unchanged. So that's this R. And so this gets turned into this. That's what that does. Applying these, you just apply this to that and that to that and, and you get that. Great. And then let's try this next step. Okay. Now we have RLR. Well, guess what? You start to look for patterns here and, and what can we expand? That's what Ada did, it expanded this into that. What can we contract? And guess what, there's an LR. And guess what an LR can be turned into with Ada? It can be turned into what? ID of C. Identity and C. So this goes and it turns it to identity and C. Um, and, and it consumed the L and the R, so it turned it into that. And this R stuck by there. It's still your trusty R. So, so it's stuck by there. Um, so now we have R composed with identity C. So we consider, okay, we start in C. We, we go from C to C, not even a shining C, but C. And then we go with R. Um, that's, that's what what this is. And so this is ends up being the same. That's just R. We just have identity before identity after. And so that's R. So this, this is a bit of a terser way of writing it. And the category theorists would just drop all the, the composed signs. And so it turned, you know, it's A to R um, they'd write. But I, I find that more confusing. That should be A to one R indicating one R is, is a natural transformation from R to R. It turns functor R into R. Okay, so that's that's that triangle equality. Um, it's just kind of expand, contract. It turns out for monads, it'll be the same thing. It'll be pretty pretty similar um, uh, in terms of expansion and contraction. Um, it's not gonna be that different. Um, Okay, so that, now let's try the other triangle equality. It isn't that bad. Okay, so here we start with L. And look, if we start with L, we could think, okay, look, you do L. Um, and, uh, but before you do L, you could do an identity on D, right? Um, yeah, you could do an identity on D. Here, over here, we did it after going with R. Here, we do it before we do L. Yeah, sure. It's the same thing. It's just L, um, but you you just go from D to D. Okay, sure. Um, uh, now, so this is a functor, a functor, and the first thing doesn't change it, but it sets it up to be acted on by these things. And I'm doing this just for fulsomeness of exposition. One L, it just it doesn't change L, it's the identity natural transformation. So it turns L into L. Ada, what does Ada do? Well, it consumes the IDD and it puts out RL. So here we get RL. So we get LRL. Okay, look at that. Now we have LRL, oh boy. 
Um, and now what can we do? Well, we've got a lot of these things. Let's hope we could contract something. And lo and behold, we have an LR. It's the same trick over there. We saw the LR, we can apply eta. It's the same trick. LR here can get sucked into an identity on C. So it gets sucked into identity on C and this L sticks around. Uh, it's just mapped with identity natural transformation to L. Okay, there we go. And guess what? These two are the same. They're just L. Those are our triangle laws. Um, and basically they say that eta and epsilon kind of play nicely together and, and work in concert. Uh, one after the other to, to produce, um, to preserve R. Um, and that's the same as not doing it, not doing anything here. So those are the triangle equalities. Any questions about that? I guess this then relies on the associ associativity of the composition. Yeah, and and it's guaranteed to be associated. That's a good question. I mean, in categories and in composition of morphisms, and in fact, in composition of functors, which are morphisms um, in, uh, in a category, um, category, small categories, for example, um, the, um, the, the associativity is guaranteed explicitly. It has to be associative. And, and if you think about it, function composition, for example, in Haskell is, well, in, in another language is um, as a functional for, for pure functions. It's, it's um, associative. Um, if you have F, G, and H, um, you know, you can take, um, compose, take, have a functions f of g and, and give it as an argument, the return value of h, or you could have, you know, uh, g of h and give it and do that and, and put its return value into f and you'll get the same thing. So yeah, it's, it, it, it is required to be, um, uh, to be associative. The, the, in other words, the parentheses, location of the parentheses don't matter. That's right. Good question. Other questions? So this is some of the details which others left out. I just wanted to have it there. You don't have to memorize this at all, but, but you should know that these occur. And a lot of the reason I did this is because if you watched it otherwise and you didn't know this notation, you could be mightily confused. And even just knowing, okay, these things are functors here. These things are natural transformation, even though you see R in both, you know, uh, here it's, it's uh, here, here it's being used as a natural transformation for identity, which is confusing as all get out for, for people just coming to this here, it's a functor. But um, if you unpack it, you know, you can, you can deal with that, um, um, that step by step instead of all at once. Any question about that? Okay, I, I, barring that, I'd, I'd like to go on to definition two, and I'll see if we can open it up for for questions in a couple more minutes. Okay, so that was definition one. Definition one, you know, appealed to this notion of systematic similarity. It said, okay, instead of assuming you know, identity, uh, you know, inverses, perfect isomorphism or equivalence. Uh, you know, we have something close to an isomorphism. Here we have uh, a relationship between L and R um, that admits natural transformations. It's equipped with two natural transformations that end up having, having to commute in this way. You have to be able to, in other words, uh, epsilon and eta have to play together nicely in a way that's consistent with um, just leaving R alone. They have to kind of work to to uh, to um, you know do their job in a way that that would leave R unchanged or L unchanged. Um, the second definition is in in many ways it's uh, 
more intuitive, I think, um, but it has some subtleties for sure. And it's very useful at, at a uh, practical level, but it's harder to motivate. Um, I think it's interesting both Bartosz and Eugenia Chung start with this motivation of similarity. Um, but uh, here, it's harder to, to motivate. It's beautiful, but it's harder to motivate where it came from, whence it came. Um, and the idea here is, look, we have this setup, these functors, sorry, these categories, C and D, when these functors go in between them. And basically it consists of observing that there's an isomorphism between the HOM sets induced from LD to C, which, which is in C. Um, this, this HOM set, this set of morphisms between LD and C, for any C in C, any D in D, you pick a C, you pick a D, I don't care which one, I'm going to tell you that how L maps maps D um, in its relationship to, to whatever C you picked is going to be, you know, there, uh, it's just going to be a renaming. Um, uh, it's going to, it's going to be a one-to-one -one correspondence. There's a bijection between that, that set of, 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 um, of, of, of uh, morphisms and how R map that C and whatever D you picked. Um, so here we're, we're capturing this, this kind of similarity between, between these categories or whatever C, whatever D, there's this, there's this relationship between how they look and C as, as mapped over from, from D via L and how they look in D as mapped from, mapped over from R, they have to look, you know, like each other in the sense that they're, they're isomorphic, uh, these, these things. So wherever structures in place uh, over here in D has a close cousin over here in C. Um, and this is true across the board for C and D. Now that's a very strong thing. You're quantifying over C, all C and C, all D and D. Um, and you're saying that there's this, um, there's this correspondence. So there's a certain intuition to it um, that, um, that's kind of appealing because you're obviously saying there's similar structure in here in the version of C and D in the version of D and C, if, if, if we consider each of them, you know, those versions of each other are very similar. Um, and, and the fact that there's this bijection, this kind of, hom this, this uh, isomorphism between them, um, it's not saying they're exactly the same functions, but they correspond to each other. Um, it's like a one-to-one -one correspondence of them um, for all C and all D. Their versions in C and their versions in D have this close one-to-one -one mapping. Um, and here, um, there's this additional condition, which is, not only is it an isomorphism, it's, it's got to be natural in both C and D. And, and this is a technical condition, but it, it's a, a one that Spivak and Fong map out. And um, I don't know that we have time to go into it right now, but it, I've tried to, to capture it here in notation consistent with how I and, and Bartosz tend to write uh, these, these, um, these diagrams. And essentially it has to do with a naturality square and, and you can go and you can lift a function um, 
uh, over in in D, and then map it um, um, map it over, um, uh, and or you can uh, lift it over here in in C, uh, and uh, excuse me, you can map it with L and you can map it with R. Um, and these are the components of the natural transformation. And this is basically your naturality square. It's uh, exactly this sort of naturality square, but with the added twist that you're doing it um, at once in, in kind of two different, um, uh, two different ways with respect to C and D. I don't think I'll go into this much right now. We might revisit it last time, but I will say that it brings out contravariance here, okay? You'll notice that, um, that this first term is actually um, uh, has this reversal. So you have G being from D prime to D, whereas C is from C to C prime. These are um, uh, for morphisms. Um, and, and so you have to map in a contravariant way here. And the reason is that this is a Hom set. It's, a, it's from LD to G, to C rather. Um, and in general, if you, if you have something that's from X to C, let's say, um, and uh, I want to, to lift something, um, to operate instead, so it's instead of from X to C, it's it's from Y to C, um, because I I consume an X and map it to C in this Hom set. I, I, I'm consuming it. I need the X. Um, then I'm going to need to pass something that takes a Y and produces uh, an X. Um, and so that's what's going on. Whoa, uh, here is it's producing. Uh, a D and uh, taking a D prime. Uh, whereas um, for the second element of Hamset, the thing that's produced, it, it's going to go from C to C prime to map over in this sort of way with F. So there's this contravariance that we saw earlier with contravariant functors where, where we need to, um, to have it flipped because um, uh, we, you know, we, we, we have to, um, we can't map over something which takes an X as if it has an X. We have to uh, map over it with something that takes a, a Y and produces an X. And so instead of mapping X to Y, we, we, we pass it over, we map over something that's Y to X. Um, I won't dwell on this right now, but uh, I just want to note these two definitions, while they look very different, um, are actually uh, close cousins. And, and the idea here is take a look at this correlation. This is the correlation. I want you to remember this actually, because it will be useful in our many, this is the, the, my main go-to uh, adjunction formula. Okay. Uh, we have categories C and D. I'm gonna give you some mnemonics here, C and D. The left, the functor L is the left functor and it goes to C from D mm -hmm. and right goes to D from C. And I like to think C on the left, category on the left, R, uh, D on the right, L goes left from right to left. And in this formula, which may seem impenetrable, it's C on the left and D on the right, just like it is laying out the categories. Spiva can probably reverse them, which I don't find as appealing. So C is on the left, um, D is on the right, just like they are visually. The L, the left functor is on the left. Here, it's left, it's on the left-hand side. The right one is on the right-hand side. Spiva can fong they have that flipped around, um, uh, which I find confusing. So left functor on the left-hand side, okay? Right functor on the right-hand side. And so what this is saying is, look, Whatever C, whatever D, LD to C and C is you know one to one correspondence with a D to RC over here in D. This L over here is on the left, and, and the R is on the right. 
otherwise you're it's just uh, the uh, argument by itself now um how do you derive the unit laws well it's it's quite beautiful unit and co-unit how do you do this it's quite nice um okay from this relation um to get unit all we do is we substitute c it's a trick look um um this is some arbitrary this is this is true for any c that that uh, the hum set from LD to C um, uh, will be in one-to-one -one correspondence with this. So it's it's definitely true for C equals LD itself. Um, so if we have, I mean, if it's true for all C, it's got to be true for C equals LD, right? Um, and so we can substitute it, and we'll make C LD, and we'll put it on both sides. So if, if this is true for any C, we'll, we'll plug in C equals LD. After all, we could choose what C we we want and and um, we could choose a, a C that that is the same as LD. Sure, sure, okay, fine. And then we have this on the left and we have this on the right. All I've done is I plugged in LD for C here. Um, and I changed the parens just to, to emphasize this, but it doesn't doesn't matter. Now this thing on the left here, where my mouse is, is a very special sort of thing. That's not, we chose it artfully. It is true, but there's something special about this Hom set. What do we know about, for any object Y, what do we know about C, Y, Y? How, how what, what is it that's special about that Hom set that sets it apart from every other, um, that, that, that sets it apart as a home set. We know something about this home set. What do we know about this home set? For any C, Y, Y, what do we know for, for any Y? Remember, this is asking about morphisms from LD to LD, or in general, from morphisms from Y to Y. What, what do we know about that? Could it have nothing in it? What's the definition of a category say? Uh, there must be an identity morphism. There must be an There has to be at least one thing in it. At least one thing. One stinking thing. The identity has to be there. Has to be there. All right? This has to be a size at least one because it's asking about morphisms from a thing to itself. And there's got to be at least one identity morphism by the definition of a category. Okay. Now, if we know there's an identity morphism there, and we know this is a one-to-one -one correspondence with this, there's got to be at least one morphism here from D to RLD. That's unit. Because every object that's identity is guaranteed to exist at least one element and one element of this. And so there, there's got to be at least one component here um, for D. Um, uh, they'll take D to, to RLD. That's what this is saying. There's got to be at least one thing going from D to RLD. Okay. So we're guaranteed to have that unit for D. Guaranteed to have it. Mm -hmm. um, so. This is unit, this pops out. All it does to get it, you just substitute C equals LD and you have this natural transformation for, for any D. You could, you could go and do this for any D, create this and you'll get that component of the natural transformation. There you go. Now for co-unit, it's a similar trick. All you do is you're substituting in D equals RC. So then you have RC equals RC. And what this is telling you is, hey, look, you know, at least there's one of those. So there's gotta be one of these. So LRC to C has to be of size at least one. There's gotta be at least one of one component for C for this natural transformation. And it goes like this. And collectively those components then make up the natural transformation for co-unit for the co-monad 
And these ones make up the natural transformation for unit for the monad. Um, okay, so, so it turns out that what we saw in definition one with this unit and this co-unit, it ends up popping out of this foreign looking definition um, as, as a condition. And in fact, the triangle equalities end up popping out from the naturality conditions uh, associated with um, uh, mumble, associated with this, that it's natural in both C and D. So basically they come out of this, um, uh, this sort of uh, situation. So, so you end up having um, all the elements of definition one being specified by definition two. But I find definition two more helpful. It's harder to motivate it front, up front that, oh, we can get this isomorphism between Hom sets. Uh, but at the same time, <clears throat> this ends up being really useful and it connotes <clears throat> the fact that fundamentally we're talking here about two categories, C and D, having tremendous amounts of common structure. Again, pick any C, any D, you pick them, whatever ones. Um, I will tell you that the picture of the world that they see um, from D to RC and from LD to, to C, you know, I, I have an R, I have an L, I have these categories C and D. Any two objects you pick C and D, I can guarantee you there's this tremendous similarity back and forth here between these. One is just kind of the, the, the mirror of the other. Maybe it's a distorting mirror. Maybe it's a, um, it's a mirror that elaborates things. Maybe it's a mirror that, that um, you know, adds some twists in or has some, some extra components associated with it. But there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between them. This world of D is kind of a, a twisty version of the world of C. Uh, it's, a, um, it's a systematic mapping between the two that, that um, heralds the, uh, the fundamental similarities in place. And when that's the case, it's a beautiful thing because it tells us the things we know about C will tell us about uh, you know, things in D. And from a software structure perspective, it may mean we only need to maintain one and the other can be produced or specified in a, in a very formulaic way from, from the first, a very, very straightforward declarative way from the first. So this, structural similarity of Hom sets, I actually find much more appealing in, 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 in this notion of similarity, systematic similarity. So if we go back you know, to these adjunctions, what we're going to find, and we're gonna go on a dive into a set of them next time, and I'm gonna watch, ask you to watch some videos, um, uh, we'll find a whole lot of these, which, which have these, you know, these categories, which are close cousins. So you have, um, for example, uh, uh, currying uh, in one category. Uh, well, you have a currying adjunction. So you have pairs in one category and you have functions that take pieces of those pairs in, in the other. Um, or you have um, uh, products and you have, um, things that just uh, duplicate uh, items. Um, and on the flip side, you have co-products. Um, you can have uh, monoids um, on one category and set on the other. And, and set will be in this correspondence uh, with free monoids um, over in monoids. So every free monoid has this underlying set and every underlying set is associated with a free monoid. 
that guarantees this similarity in structure um, uh, to it uh, in its mapping with, with other monoids. Um, so um, you get this appearing again and again that you have these structural similarities. Um, and you, know, you might think of it as capturing the essence of C and D or expressing the fact that C and D are essentially similar. They're, they're fundamentally the same rules playing out just um, um, in some systematic difference. Um, mutatis mutandis. Um, it's, it's the essential thing. You're changing just the inessentials. Um, so that's, that's the vision of adjunctions. And what we're going to be doing, as I said, is looking at, um, at how these play out in, in different uh, contexts. Uh, we're going to look at them for Galois connections. Um, and uh, we're going to look at them with free and forgetful functors. We're going to look at them with some classic uh, things like currying and, and exponential objects. Um, and uh, so in terms of uh, functions, um, pairs and, um, and um, so product and, and uh, the diagonal functor. Um, and for next time, to help prepare us for this, um, particularly for the Galois connection component, I'd like you to review the following videos. And I'll send this via uh, email. Um, uh, so uh, David Spivak um, has some nice material. This is joint with Brendan, I think, Brendan Fong, on uh, pre-orders, uh, which applies to post sets. And then there's um, some discussion on, on this in the Applied Category Theory course from two years ago, I think, um, uh, 2019. Um, uh, where uh, pre-orders to discuss. Now, the issue is pre-orders are a type of simple category and they'll sharpen perhaps some of your thinking about categories, but um, functors between pre-orders or functors between posets, which again are a close cousin with one just being um, collapsing of isomorphism in the other, um, those functors will turn out to be monotone maps because a link between X and Y in one category um, uh, by a functor needs to be mapped into a link in the other category. And so if there is a link in the source category, um, the, uh, the functor needs to map that to a link, an actual link in the other category. And that means if X is less than Y in the source category, F of X has to be less than F of Y in the target categories. And that means F is by definition monotone, um, monotonic. It, it maps smaller things to smaller things and bigger things to bigger things. So that's the um, monotone maps. Those are functors. Um, and then you'll see Galois connections. And Galois connections will, will give some concrete examples that are wonderful associated with uh, adjunctions. And I might send some additional links uh, again to John Bice's writing on Azimuth Forum um, involving uh, some nice examples there. Um, and I've asked you to, to review this other thing of Galois connections as well, because often Spivak and Fong have sort of different ways of presenting it with, with different emphasis in the same, uh, same course. Um, so I'd ask you to look at that. Um, and uh, we're going to go uh, into some examples next time of adjunctions through a Galois connection lens. But you'll also know, you'll also learn about uh, pre-orders and post sets, which are, which are really useful. And they're useful in modeling, they're useful in programming, they're useful in compilers. And um, in general, they're, they're kind of uh, really handy and um, uh, easily graspable uh, concepts that are very practical and um, turn out to have deep uh, implications as well. So we'll see this next time um, as we talk about um, Galois connection lens on adjunctions. Um, so it's uh, adjunctions for pre-orders or, or post-sets. Um, uh, probably subsequent traversals will be looking at, at um, uh, free forgetful cases. Uh, Bartosz has some great material on that. And we'll be looking at um, 
at the case of monads and co-monads um, and, and their, um, their deep connection with uh, adjunctions. Okay, um, I've gone over here, but uh, so I think I will stop there and uh, we'll see if uh, next time we can get a little bit more time for, um, for additional questions um, to see if we can um, uh, further, further develop our thinking on, on both the case for post-sets pre-orders with, uh, with Galois connections, but al also for this case with um, adjunctions uh, more generally. Okay, thanks very much, folks. Uh, a pleasure to be with you and look forward to, uh, to going over this next week. Take care there. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thanks.